All right, here we go. We have Tony Gonzalez, a.k.a. Jeezy, the former manager of the Clips, uh, who came home from doing eight and a half years. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you for joining us here. And, you know, this is your first time here, and I think you have a very important story. So I want to go ahead and start in the very beginning. So where exactly did you grow up? I grew up in... um. Virginia, 757 area, Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Portsmouth, that oh. other area. Okay, born and raised? Yeah, I was actually, I was born in Chicago, but uh, well, let's say conceived in Chicago. My mother um, just so happened, um, my father's from um, the west side of Chicago, Humble Park, and um, my mother was visiting him when, when she, um, when, you know, when she had me, and then um, we went back to Virginia, where I was born and raised. Okay. And in Virginia, did you grow up with a two-parent home, one-parent home? Um, well, I grew up, when my mother went back to Virginia, she went back by herself. And um, her and my father, um, my real father separated. And uh, my stepfather raised me since I was, um, since I was like nine months. And um, so, you know, so he played a, he played a good role in the, in the house. Okay. And as you were growing up, were you... Was your family struggling? Were you middle class? What um, to do? Yeah, we were struggling. We um, we actually um, I, I grew um, I was, we went to Norfolk, a place called um, Robin Hood, um, uh, that's torn down now. Um, so I was about three, and then my mother um, moved to uh, Twin Canal, a place in by Green Running um in Virginia, but my grandma stayed out a place called called Bayside, which um. I ended up going to go stay with my grandma because my mother and father, you know, with them struggling, I went to stay with my grandma, you know, who actually raised me. And um, so, you know, I ain't have much. I ain't have much in the, you know, and um, but the area where I grew up in, it was a, uh, you know, all the action, everything going on, you know. But um, but my household, you know, growing up under my uncles and um my aunt uh husband. Um, who was Panamanian, you know, that's where I saw all the drugs and stuff in and out the house and, you know. Okay, so you're growing up in this house and you're starting to see drugs at an early age. Yeah. At what point did you start dabbling yourself? Um, when I was about in junior high, you know, you know, I grew up with the going up under the couch and seeing a plate of cocaine with a scrawl and I'm like, what is this? You know? So so when I got in junior high, um, I ended up finding out what that was, you know, through um going across the street to the neighborhood called Base Out Arm. And with me going over there and seeing what the guys then were doing over there, you know, I was like, Oh, I got that in my house. So um I had a stepbrother. I had a stepbrother who um my grandma and them um ended up raising too. And um, he used to go inside my uncle. He used to go inside my uncle um, jacket. He ended up finding the stash, and ended up going inside my uncle jacket, and and taking it and giving it to me. So I took it across the street to the to the neighborhood, and found a a fiend to actually cook it up for me. And that's how I, that's how I first got into the game. Okay, how old were you at the time? I was probably about fifteen. Okay, so at fifteen years old, you essentially became a drug dealer. Basically, yeah. Okay. Now, the Clips, uh, the two brothers, had they moved to Virginia at this point or not really? Um, I wasn't sure. You know, I didn't know anything about them. Uh, I didn't know anything about them until I turned probably about, i say about 17, 18, something like that. Probably like 19. Um, but um, I didn't know anything about them at the time. Okay, so from... From 15 to right around 19, were you continuing with the with the hustling? Yeah, yeah. I was, um, I had started to, you know, cause I always been, um, you know, when me had a Spanish last name, it was it was kind of easy for me to, to end up finding different connects. But um, like I said, I had an uncle who was Panamanian. And um, I remember being at my grandma's house one day and he's sitting there counting 250,000. And I'm like, wow. So um end up I end up um getting something from him and going and actually serve the other guys who was actually on the corner. 
And, um, you know, but then um, he ended up getting deported. So when he ended up getting deported, you know, I had to find my own way. So I ended up finding my own way, and um, I was friends with this guy named, named Tony. He had the same name as mine. And um, he used to cook. So, so he actually showed me how to actually cook. And uh, so we riding down the street one day, and um, a song came on the radio, 103. And a song called I Got Caught Dealing at the Age of One Five. So I'm like, hey, who is that? And he like, man, um, that's the Clips. And I'm like, the Clips? He like, yeah, that's for real group. So I was like, you know them? He was like, yeah, I know them. Like, they're at the studio right now. So I was like, well, shoot, man, I, I need to go meet them because they talking about what I like to do. So he was like, but well, I set it up. As a matter of fact, we can see we go past there tomorrow. So my mind started racing. So I'm like, all right. Is a guy in my neighborhood, I based on all named Chance. So I said, um, before we go to the studio tomorrow, I'm gonna go grab Chance and take him to the studio to see if I can get him on the radio. You know, that's how easy I think it is. But me not knowing that Chance came up under um Teddy Riley and them. Because Teddy Riley them had came down to Virginia at the time and shot a video down the beach with um with Ferrell called Rump Shaker. So I'm thinking, oh man, I can get in the game. I can get chance on. I can be this manager or whatever. And um, but everything didn't go to plan, <laughs> like I thought. Okay, so by the time you're 19, how deep in the drug game are you? I'm deep. I'm I'm I'm, I'm actually going to um, I'm going to New York with um, with another childhood friend of mine, and um, I'm transporting drugs back and forth from New York to Virginia. Okay. And we're talking about kilos, tens of kilos, hundreds of kilos. Um, I, at the time, you know, because uh, when I finally saved up my money, I was able to get one key, and then there wasn't nobody around Virginia who I can actually get it from. Like, like talking about it, um, uh, I ended up going to get one, and then it ended up turning into like three keys at a time, and I'm coming back and forth like that. Okay, so that's around what fifty thousand or so every transaction. Um. Yeah, at the time, actually, they was going for like in New York, probably about um, 20, 24, 23, something like that at the time. Okay, so it was actually more than that. It's so around 75,000. Yeah. Okay. Well, when you talk about co the cocaine game, people don't play by the rules. No. Uh, people are robbing you, people are shooting you, uh, people are selling you fake cocaine. Uh, People are snitching on you. Uh, All that's part everything, of the game. Everything that could possibly go wrong usually goes wrong in that game. Yep. So leading up to that time, what kind of losses were you taking? Um, I took a couple of losses, but I really wasn't taking no major losses because I had a, I had a, uh, I had a good team around me. So, so my losses came at just with them thinking that. They ain't really got to pay me because I'm protecting you, or they'll they'll mess up. So. It, I didn't really take too many, too many losses, you know, and and, and then how it was, you know, um, except for if I lost it on the road coming back. Um, otherwise, that ain't really take too much losses in the drug game. Okay, what about arrests during that time? Yeah, yeah, um, people was was um, people was getting, you know, getting knocked off, but um, but back then it was it was, it was a certain code though that like really people really stuck by then, like. Ain't nobody saying nothing, you know. Like it was, it was. I, I know out our way it was. It was like, like you know, if, if you get knocked, you go do your time, and that's what it was. We had a couple of people through our neighborhood who actually went ahead and you know snitched and and um, you know, and that had the bad name, but you know, ain't really had no problem with that. What about the violence? Violence was always there, I don't, I, you know. But how I did my thing. If we did, if I did get beat for some money or something like that or, you know, something started, it was a thing of I'd rather just cut them off and keep it moving because I can live another day. You know, so so I wasn't about no violence. You know, that, that's one thing. But then at the time, you know, like I said, I was surrounded by 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 good dudes and them. Like, people already knew, like, yo, if we do go trial, then, you know, but I ain't had Okay. Well, I interviewed Malice who went by no malice at that time. And he talked about how him and Pusha T uh, moved 
uh, to Virginia, Virginia Beach. And I guess they had two cousins that were running that housing project. So I guess Bridal Creek, yeah. is that right? Yep. And being in that environment, Malice started uh, moving drugs first, and then he went away to the military, and then Pusher T kind of took over, you know, did his thing at that point. We had two cousins here that basically had this housing project sewn up uh, called Bridal Creek. And these guys, they grew like freakishly big at a young age and nobody would ever mess with them, you know? So it was very easy for, for me to go out because my cousins ran everything, you know? At first they wouldn't even let me get down with anything that was going on. But, you know, after a while you learn the ropes, hanging out, everybody knowing you and knowing not to mess with you. So it was, you know, kind of easy. Were you aware of what they were doing over there or this was just two rappers that you knew that were on the radio that you were interested in at that point? Um, I know who their cousins was, you know. Um, I definitely knew who their cousin was. They were, they were older than me. Um, but, you know, as far as them being around the neighborhood, around their neighborhood, whatever they did around their neighborhood, it wasn't no concern to me over in my neighborhood. So I, I wouldn't know. Okay, so it's a totally different part of town is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay, so then you go and meet uh, the Clips. Yeah. How did that first meeting go? Um, you know, like I said, so the next day when uh, when my friend Tony, he took me over to the studio and I take, um, the, you know, uh, my neighborhood hero as far as rapping, Chance over there, he didn't tell me that he already knew Pharrell and they was all under Teddy Riley and they kind of like, you know, with Chance doing, doing a couple of songs where I think like Black Street and stuff like that, they end up putting him to the side. So me bringing him to the studio, when I got there, they was looking like, what is he doing here? So that introduction really ain't go too tough. So I end up um, leaving. I end up meeting them, you know, but um, I end up leaving, taking a chance back to the neighborhood. We end up going back the next day. And and um, that's when I end up talking to um, Pusher and Malice and Pharrell and everybody. Okay, so Pharrell was actually with him at the time. Yeah, he was actually with him. He was actually at the studio when I first met him. Okay. And yet, I mean, Teddy Riley kind of discovered the Neptunes. Yeah. And they they produced Rump Shaker, uh, like you had mentioned. And that blew up, and then the Neptunes were kind of in the game, and the Clips were their first artists that they signed to Star Trek. Yep. How big was Pharrell in Virginia at the time? Was he huge or was he just someone that was up and coming? No, nah, he was, you know, actually he was somebody who, me being from the hood, um, we used to, because he went to Princess Anne High School and I went to Bayside High, but um, I was like, probably like two grades under him. So when he was in the band, when he was in the band, I was like at the football games, couldn't wait for the football games to finish so we could end up fighting the, the other neighborhood or whatever. So he used to actually see me and I actually, knew who he was because he used to wear these space jackets and he was considered weird. So when he ended up um, doing the rump shaker thing, he had got a little, you know, he, he got local local fame, but it wasn't until like the Noriega song and all that came out that, that, that he really was on another level. Um, but during that time, he was, you know, we just looked at him like he made it and and he had more money than Anybody we knew, legal. Right. Okay. So, you meet the clips. You meet. You meet Pharrell. When does your business relationship start with them in terms of you being their manager? Um. So at the time, uh, when I came around, they was getting ready to shoot a, a video called "The Funeral." Um, out in Norfolk, and um, when they end up shooting that video, they end up um getting dropped. I think it was on Electra at the time. Right, Electra. Yeah, and then I'm getting dropped from the um from the label. So at this time Pharrell was trying to shop them another deal. So what ended up happening was um which which I wanna go too much detail in because I'm explaining that part in, in my book. Um I ended up going on the road with Pharrell and me and Pusher was actually going to different states meeting Pharrell. But I was, you know, paying my own way and stuff like that, and um, and he was having he was having push a hop on different um singles 
of, of songs that he was doing with people. You know, I was going to like LA and and you know all these different places, and um, and me and Pusha just going together because me and him end up connecting. It wasn't more so with Malice. Me and Malice didn't connect. It was more so Pusha because Pusha was more like street, and um, so me and him end up connecting and developing a good um, a good bond. And so we was actually meeting Pharrell wherever he went and push a hop on the track with whoever Pharrell was doing a song with. And um, that's how I was going for a minute until um, until Pharrell ended up getting the deal with um, with Arista. Okay. And then the clip signed to Arista. Then the clip signed to Pharrell, Arista, but they signed under Star Trek with Pharrell. And, um, and what happened was they ended up, um, they ended up was going to have Rob Walker which is which was Pharrell manager at the time, he was going to be their manager, and um, they were going to make me the road manager. But it was a conflict of interest being with Pharrell with um, Rob running the label, so he couldn't be their manager. So I went from being the road manager to saying, okay, you can be our manager. Okay, so now you're the Clips manager. On paper, officially. Yep, on paper. And they start working on. The uh, Lord Willen album. Yep. And the first single is Grind. Yeah. Were you there when they put that song together? Yeah, I, I was there when they put the song together. I was actually in the studio when they when they did it. Okay. And I had heard that they didn't really even like the beat. It was like, all right, where's the rest of it? And Pharrell was like, nah, this is gonna work. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. They they didn't like the beat. Um, you know, actually, after they recorded it and. It was me who was taking it to the different radio stations, and I'm like sleeping outside the radio stations, trying to get the the, the DJs them to actually play it on the radio. And um, this one DJ I gave it to, his name was um, DJ Dose, I think like that. So I give him the I give him the record, and I call him. I said, "Yo, you gonna play it?" And he said, "Well, I don't really like the beat. Um, maybe I can do the beat over." And I'm like, "What?" So um, he didn't play it, but end up I end up having um. DJ Stress, DJ Stress ended up playing him and Joe. They ended up playing it, and um, and uh, yeah, and, and it took off. But actually, it, it it didn't take off for about nine months because we ended up getting inside of um, we ended up doing a tour, East Coast tour, all us on a little Winnebago and going up and down the East Coast trying to get it played. Yeah, I mean it's a very unique song. I mean, just a drum beat. Like that, like something you would do on your, you know, cafeteria table, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. And uh, you got these two guys spitting drug rhymes all throughout, and it just somehow worked. Yeah. No. Yeah. Like I say, it it, it was a it was a nine month run, man, before it really hit. Because you know, for nine months it wasn't being played, and I remember that day when we was in New York and they start planning and. And Flex, I think, no, it was a sight for sound or Flex? Dropped some bombs on it, and we thought it was over then. <laughs> we thought it was over then. Okay, so then that song does well, and then when the last time, the second single comes out, and that one does even better. Yeah. And then the Lord Willen album comes out, and it goes gold. Yeah. And then, like, the clips are doing songs on, like, Justin Timberlake's first single, and all these other guest appearances, like you guys are now in the game officially. Yeah. Uh, how did it feel to come out of, you know, the background of hustling and looking over your back to finally, hey, you know, I'm part of this successful group that's making money legitimately and doing tours and getting endorsements and, and I'm part of this, I'm the manager. Yeah, I, I mean, it was, it was, it was like a dream. I mean, you know, like, it was something that I that I never thought I'd be doing, especially um, from where I came from. But um, you know, but I had you know, cause I le I had to learn on the fly, cause I didn't know what the job entails or anything. And um, but I had a lot of I had a lot of good mentors to really show me what to do and how to do it. But you know, like I say, it was overwhelming though. It was overwhelming. Cause okay. I stopped hustling because I, cause once we signed the deal, I, um, I made a pack I made a pact to them that I was leaving the streets alone. I had a gold tooth in my mouth. I went and had an operation to get that taken out. And, you know, I thought I was this corporate guy. And I said, you know, I ain't going, I'm not even going back to the hood, which was a mistake too, because once I started doing that, then people in the hood looked at me like I changed, you know, but you know, you know how that go. 
Okay. And the clips really were known for the drug rap. I mean, from the first single to Pusher T's name <laughs> uh, to pretty much every song. I yeah. mean, to this day, Pusher T, every song is talking about cocaine and drugs and so forth. How much of that, in terms of those those lyrics on that first album, how much of that was based on your life? <laughs> um, I say a lot. You know, uh, you know, I say a lot. I say, I say ninety, ninety five percent. Okay, so they'd be writing lyrics and then they they ask you for ideas. Well, input. actually, no, no, no. They never had to ask for no, for no idea or for what they seen. Um, you know, so you know they didn't have to ask me that. But I remember it was a couple of times. I remember it was a rap back in the day. Me and him was um sitting there talking, and I said to him, I, um, I, I made a statement. I said, man, for every for every car I got at at nine O's, me and him just generally talking. I said that. And he was like, and he looked at me, but he didn't say nothing. And then I heard it in the rhyme when, when he said, um, yeah, for, for every car nine, at nine nose. And I heard it and I heard it and I was like, man, I said that to him. You know what I mean? So so he was good when it came t to that type of stuff. Um, but um, but I never said, hey, you should say this, you should say that. You know what I mean? I didn't have to. You know what I mean? Because they can, they saw what was going on. Okay. So you're the manager. You leave all the street shit behind you. Mm -hmm. And now you're just focused on your legitimate career with the clips. First album comes out, like I said, it goes gold. Um, and everything is going well, but then some label issues started to happen before the second album. Yeah. Explain that. Um, so, end up, you know, we was on Arista. So, we end up finding out that... Um, that that we I remember going in the office with with the guys and um, we was in front of L.A. Reid and he was saying how you know that um Arista was getting ready to merge with Jive and you know this and that this and that so I'm like I'm like you know but with me at the time I understood what was going on but you know I'm pretty much like all right so so what does this mean you know because I never you know we never been part of a merger so it was a thing of with us going to jive which which was a pop you know label um the guys then was like mad about that because you know they felt that they didn't know how to to put out a a rap album you know a grimy gritty rap album what the clip was about so um once we got to jive it was a thing of us going in there and seeing if we can get off because pharrell ended up signing a deal with interscope so when he signed a deal with Interscope, he basically signed us away. Um, Cleese, you know, um, and the clips. So Barry was saying, yeah, so, you know, we don't want to let y'all go. Because he was looking at it like, as long as I got y'all, Pharrell is going to produce y'all anyway. So, but the guys, you know, um, was like, well, just let us go and let us, you know, because we were trying to go get a new deal. But he looked at it like, well, you know, we end up giving y'all money already. Cause they already had gave us a check, so so we locked in. So so the guys was upset, and um, you know, so that's when litigations and stuff started, and we was suing Jive and telling we wouldn't give him no album, and Barry and Pharrell was in this pissing pissing contest, and Pharrell told him, well, I'm not working with with Justin, uh, with Justin Timberlake no more, and so Barry ended up going to get Timberlake. That's when you end up hearing Timberland on all Justin stuff. Um, so, you know, it, it turned bad. Um, it turned bad. But when the guys really found out that that Pharrell shipped them away, that's when, you know, when it it, it, it kind of was bad blood, but at the time we were still talking to Pharrell every day, like, hey, what we gonna do, what we gonna do. So now he's trying to fight to go ahead and get us back. So um, what ended up happening was, you know, I ended up talking to the guys and they was like, man, you know, what are we going to do? So me and um, a guy by the name of Tony Draper, me and Draper had a good relationship. So I ended up calling Draper, talking to Draper and um, telling Draper the situation, what's going on. And he was telling me, yeah, man, I, um, I know Barry Wise real good. You know, maybe I can go and set something up and see if, um, 
see if he see if he let y'all go. So I went back to the guys and it was like, yeah, tell him to see if he can do that. So so Tony goes, he come back and say, man, Tony, I'll tell you, he don't really want to let y'all go. You know, uh, you gotta understand that that they are like. They are like a big label. Like they'll sit all day, but they got other artists. They still making money. Pharrell still making money. The guys ain't making no money. So like, you know. But Barry said he'll cut y'all another check, and let's go ahead and put this album out. So I go back to the guys and say, hey, they said they'll cut you another check. So, so they were like, all right, cool. So we start the litigations. Then up, sign, you know, get, get us another um check. And so now they got to work on this album. But now Drape is like, I tell Drake with him doing that, I let him partner up with me. I give him 10% of the management and he can help me manage the guys. Okay, so that's the the Hell Hath No Fury album. All right. But during this time, not a lot of money's being made. Yeah, there's you know, I was also in charge of um booking shows. Not only I was uh, I ended up learning that game because um in virginia i used to do a lot of rap shows in virginia bringing it to the norva and different places um so you know and then i had a nightclub well actually i had a nightclub then but um i end up um taking over all the booking so i'm booking shows everywhere different states and they tell me yo we need some more shows we need some more shows but now i'm telling them listen we can't keep going back to the same places <laughs> like you know we ain't got no song on the radio but i'm doing the best i can so you know it ended up it ended up drying up so we were waiting on the album to be complete which was taking a long time because with um because now it was the thing of they going to different producers trying to reach out and pharrell's busy so you know so it was taking way longer than than expected so that's when i had a lot of free time on my hands as you're waiting to, you know, for the clips to put together Hell Hath No Fury, you decided to hop back in the streets again. Um, yeah, but but it ain't come, it ain't come, you know, like that. It was like, cause you know, I'm talking about like two years. Did they did they have an album out or why they was recording an album? It took like two years. Like, it was taking so long that Draper came to me and said, "Hey, like, I don't want nothing to do with it no more because." Because, you know, Barrett was waiting on the album and they kept putting them under pressure. And Drake was like, yo, y'all just go ahead. I'm I'm out. Um, so he ended up leaving. But um, but what happened, how I ended up hopping back in, because, you know, like I said, it dried up. So I said, man, I got to go back to what I know. But it ended up coming because um, we was on tour, like right before all this. And um, I ended up running across a guy um, named Lowe. And um, he came to me and he was like, hey, man, anytime you want to go, y'all want to go on tour, I got a tour bus that y'all can just use. So I said, well, why would you just let us just use the tour bus? And he was like, no, well, actually, I, I'll rent y'all a bus, but then I want to have a bus to travel in back of y'all. So I said, well, why you want to do that? You just want to just be on tour with us? And he was like, no. Nah. He said, well, actually, he said, I got a couple of connections and I'm going to be moving work inside one of the, the buses. So I said, well, no, nah. I, I was like, we can't do that because if you get knocked, it gonna come back on the guy, so I, you know, I don't want to do that. So I said, um, so he was like, all right, all right, cool. But what he ended up doing was getting in the ear of some of my cousins and um, who I had out there on the road with us. And um, so they used to come to me and be like, yo, man, the guy Low said, you know, he got to work for the Low, and and it's a drought back in Virginia, and he can get it to us, but he just needs you to co-sign it. So first I wasn't with it, but then I said, all right, I'll go ahead and co-sign it. Cause he wanted me to co-sign cause he feels something happened to the work, then I can pay for it. So he ended up, um, he ended up getting with them, bringing, bringing work down to Virginia. And um, me and him ended up getting cool, but I didn't have nothing to do with the work at the time. So end up, um, me and him got so cool. I started going to Atlanta. Me and him ended up getting a, uh, another crib in Atlanta together. And, um, you know, you know, he ended up um, coming to me one day saying, uh, I got 20 keys, but um, with these 20 keys, I at least need the money up front for 10. So I called my cousins and them like, yo, you know, this is what he need. But my cousins were like, man, we don't got no 10, you know, to, to put up that, that money for that. So I'm like, I'm like, all right, well, you know what I do? I'll put the money up. I said, I'll put the money up, but I'm going to charge on the work now. 
because stuff is slow for me, so I'm just gonna charge on the work. So end up um a couple months pass and um we end up um I end up booking a show at a club called um Bed in New York. And um so I remember me and the guys all we all hop in the um excursion. We're going to do the show, club called Bed. Um and a guy named Lava, he gets a call, he gets a call to say that the clips manager and them is getting ready to go do a show at bed and um the clips manager owe um the Mexicans some money for 20 keys. So I'm like, huh? So now everybody in the truck looking at me like, what you hustling again? But I'm like, I'm like, I don't owe no Mexicans because the guy low is a black guy. So I remember getting to the club, club bed, and um I see this guy, he come up to me, he like, yo, son, you, you, you Jeezy? I'm like, yeah. So he like, uh, do you know Low? So I'm like, oh, Low. I'm like, yeah, but I ain't seen Low. And he said, well, you need to call the dude Pipe, because the dude Pipe say that the guy Low end up giving you 20 keys and you on. So the next day, we goes to um, Clinton Sparks show, and um, I call the guy Pipe, and I'm talking to Pipe, and he tells me, Hey, you know, we got a situation going on. Somebody owe for this, somebody owe for that. So you need to come out to Phoenix so um, to answer these questions. So now you're back in the drug game again. I'm back in the drug game again. Yeah. You know, at this point, do you feel like kind of frustrated with yourself? You know, you left this whole life behind to try to go legit. And that didn't really work out, so now you're back where you started, in a way? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, at the same time, I was, I was like, tired, you know, because um, it, it just, even with the music business, you know, because the music business is just like the streets, you know. Um, and me dealing with two different people, it was kind of like, like, you know, I got to deal with Pusher, then I got to deal with Malice. And then so, so you know, I don't want to say it was a babysitting job because they're grown men and they're very smart. They're very intelligent, you know, especially when it comes to being a student of the game, um, when it comes to the music, you know. So, so they take stuff real serious. But, you know, each one of them have different issues. So you got to do that. And, um, you know, but I was getting tired. I was getting tired. Okay. So now you start dealing cocaine again, and you have a Mexican connect. Well, well actually, I didn't. You know, I, I didn't get it until you know when they tell me I had to come out to Phoenix, um, and um, so I go. So I end up going out to Phoenix to to uh, explain why I don't um, owe them for twenty keys, but I owe them for ten keys. So I end up going out there and. Um, and I'm taking another one of uh, another one of my childhood friends with me out there, uh, who had just came home actually from doing like ten years. I take him out there, and we sit down with the Mexicans, and um, so we got the middleman and we got the head man. Um, the, 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 let's just call the the um, the head man Johnny, and then we got the middleman, which is Pipe. We, um, they start telling me how, you know, as soon as I walk in the room, first thing they say is, "Yeah, we love your group." And I'm like, oh, all right, you know, okay. So they like, but um, you know, we want to know, do you want to work? So I'm like, do I want to work? I'm like, well, well, hold on, let me explain to you about I don't owe y'all for the twenty keys. So he said, no, nah, we ain't worried about that right now. It's cool. I just want to know, do you want to work? And so they start talking, throwing prices all at me. Yeah, I give you the keys for seventeen, the you know the weed for two fifty and. You know, the Heron, this and that. And I'm sitting there like, man, I don't really know too much about Heron, but all right, cool. But I'm just trying to just say whatever it is so I can get up out of there. You know, so, you know, I'm hoping they say I got to come with some money. And I'd be like, man, I don't got no money. And then they'd be like, well, all right, cool. But, you know, they end up giving me the prices and stuff. We end up eating dinner. I end up leaving. Um, About a couple months later, I get a call. Is this guy, is a guy out front. He's in a van. And, um. He told me to open the garage in Spanish. I open the garage up and then I look and he told me, Mira, Mira. So I go to the van and I look and there's these big FedEx boxes, crates of FedEx boxes. And um, so, you know, I go and I help him, bring the boxes in. 
So now I'm realizing, yo, this is this is the Mexicans' work. So I run and I'm ready to go get the money for the Tim Key. So he tell me, no, 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 call Pipe, call Pipe. So I call the guy Pipe and he tell me, hey, um, you remember the prices I told you, right? So I'm like, yeah. So he like, Merry Christmas, I'll be there in a couple of weeks. And, um, you know, so the rest was, um, you know, for about a good year, I'm, I'm back in the game deep. Okay, so now you're back in the drug game 100%. Are you, you know, managing the clips anymore or did you completely step away from that role? Well, no, they still working on the album. They still working on the album. Um, you know, it's like I said, during this period of time, it took like almost two years before they even finished, before they even finished the album. So we're going back from the beginning of the two years when I'm back rolling. So, you know, and at the time I'm so deep, I'm not thinking about the, um, I'm not thinking about the music no more. The honest truth, they could have not called me no more and 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 I would, I would have been fine. Um, but, you know, I end up making so much money with the Mexicans. I end up buying a nightclub in Virginia called Encore. I end up um, moving to Miami, getting a spot in Miami when they bought me a Bentley and put the Bentley out there in Miami. So I'm, I'm out there having fun, enjoying my life. Well, according to articles, mm -hmm. According to federal documents, it said that you laundered money through several front businesses. One named as the Clips Booking Agency Sole Providers Management, uh, which basically styled themselves out as music producers, rappers, entrepreneurs, club owners, clothing designers, and other legitimate occupations in order to conceal the true sources of your income. Is that accurate? Oh. Uh no, but but like when it comes to the federal law, once once one penny of drug money is is consumed, all of it is dirty. So 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 you know even though what my trucking company was legit is 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 now tainted, you know, with the booking, you know what I mean? So, but, but I didn't launder no money when it came to that. That was, you know, I kept that totally separate. But like I'm saying, once you're in that game, they make it seem like it's all the same. Okay. And did the clips have any idea what you were doing during this time? No. Okay. I mean, you know, like I said, but except for when we got that call and they heard, you know, what was going on, they heard it. But far as, you know, after that, no. Nah. They only knew okay. what everybody else will see me will actually think. You know, why is these guys not making no money right now and you just bought a Bentley? Something's going on. Right. And I guess there was a drought in Virginia during this time. So you were pretty much the main guy that's bringing all the work in. <laughs> yeah. One of them. I'm not going to say the main guy, but one of them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here you are now back in the drug game. And then the feds, you get on their radar. Yeah. Well, I actually I was on their radar uh, I was on their radar back in 01 when I stopped. I, I was hearing, you know, people doing grand juries on me then, but I ain't really understand what the feds was. Um, but I when I ended up hopping back in, I was on their radar. I ended up getting on their radar because um the Mexican um, who I was dealing with ended up getting caught. Okay, and that's Pipe? That's Pipe, yeah. So Pipe gets caught with weed and a gun in Richmond. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. And he starts cooperating. And he actually names you. He named me and he told how the whole operation went down. He told from how I initially first came all the way to Phoenix to settle a debt and everything under the sun after that. Well, according to articles, they're saying that you're running a $20 million drug ring. That sound about right. Did you say, is that, so that's accurate? They weren't exaggerating? They'll they they put a 10 on the two a little bit, but, but, you know, but I would definitely say, say between 10 and 10 and 20. 
because because how, how they do you? it is because how they do it is everything that he ever gave me, he told everything he ever gave me. So what they do is they don't only just say okay one key, the equivalent of one key. They do it with the equivalent of how much you actually make off a key of breaking down. So if he giving me fifty keys. You know what I'm saying? It ain't just how much one key costs. It's how much you can make off of 50 keys. At your height during that time, how much profit were you making a month? Oh, man. Um, man, I was making um, I was making probably about, you know, because what I used to do, I used to, say if I get 50, say if I get 50 keys, I only put like 2,000 per key on it. And, um, and I probably sell fifty in about three weeks, two weeks. Okay, so you're moving fifty keys at this point. You're you're in the big time. This is this is not like before where you're getting two, three keys at a time. You're now moving heavyweight. Yeah. Okay. Now, in articles, they're saying that the drug ring that you were involved in was linked to Olympic gold medalist Tim Montgomery as well as former Bloods gang leader Marlon Reed. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say. Okay. But but um you know um me and Tim me and Tim Montgomery we we own Encore together. He sold me um him him and another he had a partner. It was this guy named James who owned the script club. They ended up um selling me Encore for I can't even remember how much exactly it was, but it was a transaction of some money and some weed. And um, and Tim ended up getting into that little trouble he got into, and he ended up uh, going away, so going away to prison. So when he went away to prison, I offered him some money to just buy all of them out. So when he got caught, when they said that, you know, me and Tim owned the club together, they made it seem like me and Tim was selling drugs together. But me and Tim never, ever... So no drugs together. You know, they even said that he actually had a hand in snitching on me. But, you know, you know how the streets do. The streets are just 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 throw that word around so loosely. Tim never snitched on me. He told what I bought the club for, you know, which is kind of dry snitching. But far as he couldn't snitch on me because we never did no work together. Okay. So when when Pipe gets busted, it turned into seven sealed indictments. Yeah. And it was, that included you, your friends, and actual family members. Yeah, actually, it was it was all family. Um, it was all family. It was like three of my little cousins, um, my sister boyfriend, and um, it was, um, I had a childhood friend who I grew up with who was already doing time, and they brought him up in indictment because the whole thing was they had to get like, they had to put like six people in it to make it a CCE case. It seemed like it was that many people under my control to order for it to be a CCE. You know, so you had to have, I think it's like six or more people. So they made sure that it was, it was six of us. And, you know, so the charges can like try to stick. Okay. CCE stands for what? Um, Continual Criminal Enterprise. Got it. Okay. So now you're in a sealed indictment. And the feds start tapping your phones. Yeah. What were they catching on these phone taps? Um, you know, it was did they end up they end up coming coming to get you know to speed up the indictment quicker because um something happened around um one night after my club I had a, a little cousin of mine who ended up getting killed down the street from you know in my neighborhood leaving the club one night and um you know you know people start throwing my name around blaming me saying that i had something to do with it and um you know and he's my cousin um but the thing was it ended up coming out you know that they knew i ain't had nothing to do with it because my phone was tapped so so, so you know when it comes to murder and stuff and you get the pings of the phone and they all listen to my conversation and stuff like that they knew i, I didn't have nothing to do with it um, but still, but they had to investigate and, um, doing when they had to investigate, it was a thing of, of, of making them hurry up and coming to get me because, you know, when, when the feds see that they want to come and indict you and if they feel like violence or something is occurring, they want to come and get you before something happens to you. Your name is in 
you got your name in an indictment. They're tapping your phones. You're working on the clip's next album in Miami, and people start getting picked up by the feds. Yeah. When you heard that, how'd you feel? Um, when when I heard they were looking for me. Yeah. Well, and they're picking up other people around you. Uh, um, when when they were picking up other people, I I was like, you know, I I was kind of in denial because I'm like, yeah, they're picking them up, they are picking me up, I ain't got nothing to do with that. <laughs> but um, but when I found out how close it was, you know, for a good, for a good hour, hour or two before I got the call that they was at my house in Virginia looking for me. Um, you know, man, my stomach was like all the pieces. Cause I'm still like, I'm still like, well, they ain't catch me with nothing. I'm like, they can't be looking for me. Like, how are they looking for me? And, and I'm, I'm at my house in Miami. Okay. But they ended up actually picking you up at one point. Well, you, you turned yourself in. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, the, the, so the day that, um, you know, um, the guys that were in Miami and they was on their way back to Virginia. Um, and I get the call when they was on their way back to Virginia the next morning. And, um, so for that weekend, I ended up calling my cousin. She's a, she's a lawyer, but she's not a criminal lawyer of my family. So I called her and she said, um, she got this good lawyer who used to represent like, uh, Michael Vick and Alan Iris and everybody, um, guy by the name of Woody Woodward. So, um, she ended up calling him for me. I ended up talking to him. So he tell me, listen, don't come back on an airplane, train, bus, or nothing because they're trying to make a movie out of it. Like they're trying to have, you know, put me on this big stage to make me seem like this this animal. So he said he got some um, some connections in Miami and I can go turn myself in to the Miami Federal Building. So, you know, that's what I end up doing. Did you tell the clips what's about to happen? No, well, but actually they was getting the calls because, you know, because you understand, like, all us was like all us is like family so they talked to to my little cousins and you know um just like i do so they was getting the call from different family members and and everybody telling them what was going on so so they pretty much knew it before i even knew it right because i remember when i interviewed pusha t like seven years ago and we talked about this situation he said that nine of his best friends got indicted you had a situation a while back where I think like your former manager caught yeah. like a, a major case. Yeah. Uh, how many years did he get? Uh, 32. 32 years. Yeah. Um, did, did that did that shake you up a little bit? I mean, because that, that was your homie. Yeah. <laughs> you know? More than my homie. More than your but, homie. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, yeah, of course it shook me up. But I mean, you know, um, you know, I do this for all of them. Like, you know, it wasn't, and you know, people always say my manager, man, it was nine of my best friends, not just my manager. Nine of your best friends? Yeah. Uh, Every, what, what, what was the, the, the years? A conspiracy. Okay. So, and, and it ranged from um, 10 to 34 years. And they got between 10 and 34 years each. Yeah. So this was just like a, just a clusterfuck. Like everyone started going down. That was around you pretty much. Yeah. Uh, How did the clips react to this? Like all their friends are now getting busted. He has a federal investigation and he gets sentenced to 32 years for drug trafficking. Right, right. Were, were you guys investigated as well or is that s simply towards him? That was that was towards him. Okay, that was, but that was towards I mean, but was there a certain amount of fear that went into that? Because you, you know how the feds do it. They, they try to drag everyone into it. Bro, it was an extreme amount of fear. Uh, there was, you know, you, could only, you couldn't help but wonder what the possibilities, who was going to get, you know, dragged down with that or, or you know, how everything was going to play out. But I seen, I sat and I watched, you know, all of our friends, you know, go down uh, in, in, the, in that situation. And, uh, you know, there, there, there was a, a time when I, I thought, you know, that we would be involved with that. Um, well, the, well I, I end up calling, I end up calling 
either with malice or push. I called one of them, and I, you know, because I'm still thinking there's a thing that I can call, and you can just go bond them out. So I, I called one of them, and I'm on the phone. I'm like, yo, you heard such and such? This got picked up, and, you know, they're picking up everybody. You know, they're like, yeah. I'm like, well, we go bond them out, and I, you know, I get the money when I get when I get back. But, um, you know, so, you know, at the time with them being in Virginia and me being in Miami, you know, I ain't really know how they really felt, you know. I can only imagine. Okay, and I guess Pharrell and Pusha T helped pay for your lawyer. Yeah, um, Pusha, Pharrell, and a guy named Shay. Shay, who's part of who's part of the nerds. He he looked out for for me too. He's um me and him me and him childhood friends too. Okay, so now you're locked up. Yeah, and you know the feds don't just want you; they want everybody. Yeah. So they take you into the interrogation room and they're trying to get as much information as they can out of you. What happens at that point? So so what happened was, you know, like I said, I turned myself in Miami and um, I ended up having to get transported back to Virginia. So I get back to Virginia and, uh, you know, uh, I'm sitting there and I get my name called, you know, lawyer visit. So I go and I go out and when I get to this little room, it's um it's my lawyer first. And he tell me he about to take me into this next room and it's the um it's the FBI ATF and they wanna sit and talk to me. So I'm saying like, well hold on, what do you wanna talk to me for? I am I'm, I'm like, I ain't even tell you that I'm guilty yet. So he like, No, just listen. He said, you know, I'm gonna tell you this, just listen to what they gotta say, and then we're gonna determine whether we're gonna go to trial. Or what we gonna do? So I said, "All right, cool." So I walk in the room, and as um, soon as I walk in the room, is um, the FBI, ATF, and it's the homicide detective. And um, first one I spoke with the homicide detective, and he say, uh, first I want to tell you that um, I know you ain't had nothing to do with your little cousin getting killed." So as soon as he said that right there, I broke down in tears because I was like, for, you know, because with my neighborhood, a lot of people was um, blaming me, saying that I had something to do with it. So for him to tell me that I didn't, it was like, whoa, you know, now I can really pretty much mourn knowing that, all right, cool. So then, you know, he started asking me about, do I know these guys who actually had something to do with it or whatever, whatever, you know, but honest truth, I didn't know nothing. Because even when they caught me on the wire with me telling them, I don't believe I can't, I don't know who actually who did it, because normally I find out everything that happens in, you know, in Virginia, but I, but, but I didn't know. So, you know, so that cut short with that. Cause I couldn't help them. I couldn't help them with anything on that. So the FBI comes and they say, listen, you know, but they say, we'll give it to you straight. They say, um, the guy Pike, you know, he told on uh, everything that he gave you, you know, like we got, because the one thing people don't know in the feds hearsay is admissible. So whatever a person just says, he can say he gave you a million keys and that's on record. That's a million keys. That's when you get in charge with a million keys because it's admissible. It's different from the state. The state here saying admissible. You got to go through all kind of stuff with, with the feds. It's totally different. So they say, you know, um, we got enough right now with just him and 46 other people who's ready to testify against you in Virginia. You know, because we had people just hopping up on the case. You know, you got some guys who was in prison who was trying to get their sentence reduced who said that I dealt with them in 01 and and guys them who said they dealt with me then who definitely didn't and then you got guys them who were close to me who didn't even um who was signing up to say I don't want to go down so I'm willing to testify from the street guys them who was real close that I also tell about that in my book um <laughs> um so uh so they say but with the guy Pike who's who's um actually telling on you, he won't tell us on the guy, Johnny. So they say, so, so we need you to cooperate on Johnny and we'll make sure that, that your sentence go light. They said, but, but if not, you know, you can get life. So, you know me, so I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, I ain't never been in trouble before. I'm like, most I probably get is 10 years. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know nothing. Nah, you know, because I'm not going to tell him my friends. So he said, um, 
But we also want you to know that and put out paperwork and stuff implicate my mother, my wife, my sister, and my aunt. And um, said, and if you don't help us out, we're going to have a indictment to go pick them up tomorrow. So I'm like, okay, and you're, and you're, you're how old at the time? I'm 33, I think, 33, 34. Okay, so at 34 years old, you're being told that you're facing life and they're going to lock up your mother, your wife, your your sister, and my aunt. all that. Yep. And this is documented. And your aunt. Yeah. Okay. How did you feel at that point? Um, I, I mean, I was like, like, you know, down the truth, like, I grew up on a certain code that, that you're supposed to keep your mouth closed. You know, but um, when you start mentioning the women in my life, you know, I'm like, wow. But then I'm like, okay, my mother is a hustler. So she, she, she understands that it's consequences. So, you know, if, if you sell drugs, you know, and you go to prison, it is what it is. My aunt also, which is married to my uncle who's Panamanian, she was, she was in the game too. But, um. When it comes to my wife and my sister who don't know anything about prison, drugs, or anything, I'm sitting there like, yo, they can't go to jail. You know, so I'm, I'm like, I got to try to figure this thing out. Okay. And they offer you something called immunity papers. Y yes. So they tell me um, that we can give them immunity. All I need to do is sign, and um, we can go ahead and give them immunity for me to... Um, to cooperate against the guy Johnny, which is the other Mexican. And, um, you know, so, so I tell them, I say, um, I can't answer them right now. I say, I need time to think about this. So um, to make a long story short on that, I end up going back to my cell because they told me to, to just to think that they ain't going to pick nobody up yet, but just think, and they're going to come back tomorrow. They ain't going to try to give me no week to think or <laughs> any of that. So I'm like, all right, so I go back and I start calling I'm calling everybody. I'm like, yo, listen, this right here, what's going on? You know, da 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 da. Um, you know, the, when the first person I call, I call my mother. I'm telling her, I'm like, mom, you know, this is what's going on. They told me I'm coming to pick you up, and she's like, what I do? I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, this is what they said you did because what my mother did, even though she got her own little people who she do a little operation with, Piper was telling how, you know, I'd probably be out of town or something like that. He'll come, and I have my mother give him a whole bunch of money. So from her just taking money and just giving it to him, you know, that's how she just implicated. Um, with my wife, she um, she had some money orders in her name that she didn't know what it was for. I had her give me some money orders, and I took the money orders, and I gave it to somebody, and they got caught with the money orders that had her name on it. Or did they end up knowing that the money orders came from her? So they're trying to say that she knew about it, which she, which she totally didn't. So... As I'm telling my mother, that's the first, like I said, that's the first person I called, and I tell her that they were going to pick her up. And she like, well, first thing she said is, well, I heard you snitching. And I said, huh? I'm like, how you heard that? Like, I just had this meeting. How did you hear that? I said, well, well, I'm telling you this. They're going to come pick you up. So she like, pick me up? So she like, why are they going to do that? I'm like, man, you know, so I explained to her. And she said, well, you need to tell them, but they need to know. <laughs> and I'm like, well, hold on. I said, hold on. I said, don't work like that. I said, but I'm just letting you know this is what's going on, da, da, da. But then I called a couple of friends up and I told them what was going on. So everybody who I basically talked to said, yo, the only thing is, if you end up going to tell on the guy Johnny, with him being, you know, Mexican and then Phoenix, it can be repercussion on my family anyway. You know, so I got to weigh that. But they saying like, okay, so the Mexican guy pipe tells on you and now they want you to tell on Johnny and he's Mexican. So making it seem like they don't care nothing about me. So I need to decide what I'm going to do. So, you know, Guys, them, you know, who I grew up with and different type of individuals said to me, yo, do what you need to do and we'll protect your family as long as you're in there. Because I'm looking at it like I'm still going to get my time, but as long as my family get immunity and they ain't going to prison, I'm cool. Okay. And, and you don't actually know the affiliation of these Mexicans that you're dealing with. You don't know if they're you know, Sinaloa cartel, Mexican mafia. You just know these are just a couple of Mexicans that are your plugs. Yep. I don't know. I don't, I don't know nothing about them. I don't even know. I ain't even know his real, I ain't even really know his real name. <laughs> okay. But 
you know, you've heard horror stories about what happens when you cross Mexicans. Yeah. Yep. You know, the killing of your whole family. You know, I mean, they, in Mexico, they really wild out. I mean, entire villages, you know, heads in the middle of the courtyards, police chiefs getting killed. Um, you know, I mean, there's a, the whole El Chapo story and so forth. Uh, how scared of you are you, you know, at this situation of testifying against what seems to be a high-ranking Mexican drug dealer? You know, I was I was scared for my family because I'm in, you know, I know I'm going to be in prison, you know. So my family being out there, not under my protection, you know, it was, you know, it was one of the weakest, weakest points of my life that I felt like I got to depend on guys who I grew up with and, you know, to basically protect them, you know. Um, and, and then not only that, the scary thing about it was when they had when they had bought that first initial van to my um, address, I never told them where I stayed at. So, you know, so I, I don't know how they even got my address to where I was at, which I only take that the guy low probably told them or anything. Like, I mean, I don't know. Or the driver probably already had been there. I mean, I don't know. So, yeah, I mean, I, I was scared. I was scared. Okay. You know, when going through various articles, it said that you were sentenced to 32 years. Yep. But then I'd also heard 20 years. So which one is it? No, I was sentenced to 32. 384 months. That's how they say it in the fair. Okay. So you go to trial or you do a plea deal? No. So, so, so. You know, the next day I end up going inside the office, you know, um, and I signed the papers for to give my family immunity. So I signed the papers and I tell them, you know, whatever y'all need me to do with the guy, with the Mexican guy, Johnny, you know, I'm cool with. Um, so I signed the papers and um, I end up getting sentenced to the 32 years and I end up going up the road. Wait, so you took a 32 year plea deal? Yeah, I took a 32-year plea, plea deal, which, which they was trying to give me life, but they said, okay, with me not being in trouble, the, the, that was the whole thing. With me never being in trouble before, my guidelines came to 32. So um, if I would have had like one like one like one charge on my record that was like crazy, it would have put my guidelines up and I could have got life. But because I never been in trouble, that would give me the 32 years. So I basically signed signed to to to... An open plea. It was an open plea. So when I go in front of the judge, then he stuck with the guidelines. He gave me the low end of the guidelines um, for the 32 years. Okay. I mean, from the outside looking in, to take a plea deal of 32 years when you're, what, 34 years old at the time, you're getting out at 66? That does not seem like much of a plea deal. I mean, why not just say... I'm going to take it to court and see what I could do there. Because I can't have my mother them locked up. I can't have my wife locked oh, up. okay. I can't have my sister locked up. I can't have my aunt locked up. Like, this was real. Like, you have people in prison who I actually seen who actually just, who try to justify for, for, for their actions. That They might say, um, you know, the just figure speaks like the guy 6'9". Um, He's trying to justify for saying, oh, that they did it to my girl. You know what I mean? So, so that's trying to be a justification to say, oh, I'm going to see this because you try to do it to my girl. That's not nothing that's that's really saying that he, they really did it to the girl. You know what I'm saying? So he's trying to justify why he's doing what he's doing. Oh, they took my money. but with, And not saying that I'm any different from him, but what I'm saying is mine is documented to say, I got your family. What you going to do? This is like <laughs> in black and white. You know, so it's like this or that. So it was like me go to trial, they get locked up, but in the feds, I was already got because when you got the connect telling on everything you bought from them, I was going to lose trial and I was going to get life. I was going to get life. So I'm looking at it like okay. I take the 32 years and I can sleep good knowing that my family ain't locked up. When you talk to certain people, like, for example, when I interview Boosie, he has a very hard line when it comes to what he considers snitching. If you cooperate for any, any reason... That snitching. So he did that to get out of trouble. Right. You know, he did that to get out of trouble, so he a rat. You know, he did that to get out of trouble, you know. 
he basically did that to get out of trouble. You know, I just feel like he was going to take that to the grave. You know. So, and, if you were facing 25 years. I don't give a fuck what I'm facing, Vlad. We live by codes, man. I don't give a fuck, man. Niggas be talking about all that rap. You nigga ain't folding. You put yourself in that position. You fucked up. Anybody put they self in that position, nigga, you fucked up. It's on, it's on you now. Whatever go, I come at you, it's on you, man. You fucked up. Nigga, nigga, you did that. Fuck all this, who did that, who doing this and all. You did that. Fuck okay, all that. So, so telling on someone who's dead, that's still considered snitching in your, in your book. Yeah. Yes. You know, he was on death row, ready to take a needle and, and be on every uh, project, uh, you know, mural and so forth. Other people will look at it and say, well, if someone's snitching against you, you're allowed to, to, to snitch, you know, to tell on them back. Some people are going to look at what you did as snitching. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what it is. So you would say it's snitching? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's snitching uh, uh, like, because I believe in... A small lie and a big lie, it's still a lie. <laughs> you tell on one person, you tell on a million person. You, 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 you're still told. I mean, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way around that. But, you know, but even from when I went to prison, I had it, I, I had it easy in prison. Because once you get to, to these different prisons, and I ain't started at no camp, I started at some really tough spots. Um, you gotta show your paperwork. So when I go show my paperwork and it explains about such and such, such and such, and they look at it like in prison, that's how they looked at it. When they see it and say, okay, you got a Mexican guy who told on you, and you told on this other Mexican guy, because he didn't want to tell on the Mexican guy, but then you did that, so your family wouldn't go to prison. Oh man, you know, but then when you put that in your mind on what you what will you do, they're looking at it like, man, that's a tough pill. Now you got people who gonna say, oh man, because you know, I had people say this in prison. But you shouldn't have had your family involved in it. But like I told them, my family wasn't involved in it. That's what the feds do. So, you know what I mean? But you got to put yourself in that situation. So you can't say what you're going to do until you get put in that situation. Well, I mean, but to be fair, you did involve your family. I mean, your mother dropping off money for drug payments, your your wife cashing checks that, that are tied to drugs. I mean, you're smart enough to know that you are actually involving them along the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It it is what it is. Uh so now you start your prison time and you have 32 years at the start. Yeah. Okay. So you start your 32 year prison term and based on the paperwork that you signed initially, they want you to testify against Johnny. Yeah. So then they fly you out to Phoenix, I guess? Yeah, so so, so like 5 years so about 5 years later I end up getting, um, <laughs> I'm on the yard, I end up getting called to go back to court. Now I got guys, them, you know, basically looking at me like, yeah, where you going, you know? Um, so I'm explaining to them what's going on. So I end up flying out to Phoenix. Um, and when I get to Phoenix, um, I'm, 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 I'm nervous, because like I said, I never been on a stand before. I like, I never had touched no stand to point nobody out or do any of that. Um, so when I get there, I'm nervous. And the first person what they first person I see is Johnny. They got him in one cell and they got me in one cell. And um he looks at me and he say, um, um, I want you to know that um I understand your situation. Um I had my guy, um, if he would have he said, if I had my guy would have hold hold his weight and not put your family up against against me then um, you wouldn't be in this situation. And he said, um, so I want you to know there ain't gonna be no repercussion on my end. So, I mean, when he said that, a whole relief just, just, just go like, whew. But I'm like, is he lying? <laughs> but then he said, um, but I'm not even going to trial today. I'm like, yeah? So he's like, yeah. Um, so he tell me that, um, that he's pleading out. So I'm like, whoa, okay, cool. So I'm like, hold on. Now I'm thinking to myself, same thing you asked me a while ago. I'm like, he pleading out. I know he's going to get life. <laughs> Why is he pleading out? Why he don't go to trial? Was his family involved too? <laughs> so he said, um, you know, but he don't tell me. But he don't tell me that. So he said he pleading out or whatever. 
So probably about a couple hours later, um, they come to get me and and to take me back to the county jail in Phoenix, whatever. So they tell me, um, um, so you know, so before we were ready to go, he, he told me, he was like, man, you know, just, you know, he basically telling me that he's sorry, that he's sorry for, for a pipe, you know. So I'm like, all right, cool. So so I so. At the time when I'm leaving, it's like a relief, but at the same time, I'm like, is he lying? So I get back to I get back to the compound and um talk to my lawyer, and my lawyer basically tell me that the guy Johnny is cooperating. That's why he ended up pleading out and um it won't no trial. Okay. But based on your deal, you did what you were you told them you were supposed to do, so you actually fulfill your end of the bargain. Yep, I fulfilled my end of the bargain. So they came and said, um, okay, well, um, we're gonna go ahead and give you um take your time to sixteen, uh, sixteen years. So my lawyer was like, Hold on, why are you taking it to sixteen years? And he signed up for to do what he supposed to do. But they looked at it like, Well, he ain't, I didn't touch the stand, I didn't have to testify, so so, so you know, because it's like in the feds, if you get on the stand and have to testify and all this, they're supposed to, you know, kind of look out for you more. So my lawyer like, well, hold on. He took a chance just to, to put his, you know, that something could happen to his family, put his life on jeopardy and the whole nine. Y'all need to do more than that. So he ended up filing this paperwork and um, th three months later came back and it took my time to 10 years. So you went from 32 years to 10 years. Yep. That's a hell of a reduction. Yep. During this time while you're locked up, are you on the phone at all with, with Pusha T and Malice? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm on the phone with um I, I'm on the phone with Pusha a lot. I'm on the phone with Pusha a lot. Um I'm on the phone with Malice. Malice sending me cards. Um Yeah, I'm on the phone a whole lot. I'm... Okay. And now because you're gone and you're the breadwinner of the family and you have kids as yeah, well? I got three daughters. You have three daughters, you have your wife and I guess every so often your wife hits up Pusha T on holidays and so forth to help out with some money. Yeah, she hit them, you know, because I got the kind of wife that's like, she's like real independent. So she's not just going to just keep calling. So, um, you know, but like your know, holidays, she'll call and, not, you know, going back to school, she should call. And and he answer every call and he make sure that whatever she want he get to. Her. He looked out. Okay. Well, you get out. Pusher T is now in full swing. He's now you know rolling with Kanye, doing good music. Uh, his album does well. Uh, Malice becomes a Christian rapper. He changes his name to No Malice. Uh, you know, and I remember I interviewed him. You know, he said that one of the, the triggering points for him to kind of do a 180 is he started thinking about how many people were killed listening to the clips or killed somebody listening to their music and their stories about drug raps and, and the violence and everything else like that. So he's completely out of that same game that he was in before. How many people went to jail listening to the things that that I said, forget everybody else, you know, and, and other rappers and other groups. Think about how many times people got pulled over, went to jail, my record playing in the car. Think about how many times somebody head was blown out, you know, and and the, the theme music still playing or whatever, whatever. Because I know I liked who I listened to and wash my car to it, you know, pump my gas in it, and it was just the theme music to, to my life. But Pusher T is in full swing, and the two you actually meet up after you get out of prison. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, um, he, came to, he came to visit me when I, got, when I came home. He came to visit me. Okay. And he gave you a check? Yep, he gave me a check, he gave me a nice check. Can you say how much? Nah. Okay, but it was a nice check. It was, yeah, it was a nice check. That I never ever told anybody. And, and I only say that because it was rumored that I told people how much he gave me and I was unappreciative, which I felt was an insult. 
Okay. So you get out and you and Pusha T are cool again, but Pusha T has someone in his circle that you're not cool with. Mm, I don't really want to talk about that. I don't really okay, want to talk about fair that. Enough. Fair enough. I might put it in you the know, book, and, though. I, that's what I might end up doing. Okay. I might put it in the book, though. I might put it in the book. Okay. Fair enough. And, you know, we're going to go ahead and show this picture. You and Pusha T actually take a photo uh, together. Yeah. After you got out. Oh, you got that photo? <laughs> I got that photo. I see you do your work, huh? <laughs> Yep. Uh, number one, how did you feel about Malice, you know, becoming a Christian rapper and changing his name to No Malice? Um, you know, the funniest thing is, you know, like I actually I start my book, I I start my book like that, was was basically talking about the conversation that me and Malice had right before I got picked up, and he was pretty much, he didn't say he was gonna go get saved, but he told me you know, that he was pretty much going to bow out. But, um, cause he didn't know, you know, we didn't know, you know, what would happen, you know, the situation happened with me, with me. But, um, I looked at it like, you know, and not saying that a person can't find God after the fact, but I just looked at it like he was scared. He was scared and, and, you know, he, he did what was best for him. So he turned, so he turned to God, you know, cause he didn't know, I mean, he didn't know what could have happened. Now, I remember, I don't know if it was after he got picked up or after he got sentenced, but I think he had put up a video basically saying, hey, look, we ain't got nothing to do with this. You know, my car is on stock rims. And, you know, he basically was like distancing himself from that whole situation. Uh, and, you know, I think and most people would be scared. Because he didn't have nothing to do with it. Yeah. Because ultimately the clips... Never got charged with anything. Uh, they they never cooperated against anybody. They were basically just the rappers. When when you were being hemmed up, were they trying to say, "Hey, look, what are the clips doing?" Because it looks a whole lot better if you get some 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 star rappers of indicted as opposed to just you know their manager, uh, who of most people have never heard of. What were you telling them when they were bringing up, you know, uh, Pusher T. Mouse's name? The, the same way when they brought up friends of mine who didn't get who didn't get caught up, um, that they wasn't doing nothing, that they was rappers. They they asked me, you know, had they ever did anything? I told them, no, nah, it was me. I told them if, if they did something, I ain't know about it. The same way I did with a whole lot of my my other friends, which was which could have got me in a lot of trouble far as with my friends because you know because in the feds if if they ask me about somebody and they end up going to pick them they're going up and i tell them no nah, don't do nothing and they end up going to pick them up and then they come in and say they did do something with me now the paper i signed for my family to have immunity is now in the void and then they can go pick pick up you know my family but i that's me taking a chance to say please don't bring that one of my friends in, <laughs> you know? So, you know, because I wanted to be able to still, you know what I mean? Walk around, you know, without that on my mind of that I did something to, to anybody I grew up with or anything. But they asked well, me, but they asked me and like I told them, all they do is rap. That's what I told them. I told them whatever they rapping about, it was about me. I mean, you know, they artists. Were the clips actually questioned? Were the clips like brought in and interrogated and so forth? Not that I know of. I didn't hear that. Well, you get out. Pusha T gives you a check. You guys hang out a little bit, you know, like, which is where the photo came from and so forth. But at one point, you and Pusha T kind of had a falling out, drifted apart. Something happened between your relationship. So what exactly happened? Um... You know, I, I think it was a thing of um, of not only that, you know, we moving in two different directions, but um, 
but we did have a falling out. You know, that's the last time I talked to him. We had a little argument because I wanted to put I wanted to put my book out, and um, I told him he thought it was he thought it was a bad idea. Um, so you know, I end up bringing up, you know, in the heat of the argument, I end up bringing up about the snit song and what I had to go through in prison, what, what could have got ugly. And, you know, and he said some things, you know, that, you know, because, which I understand, I understand from his point of view of, he had to clean up a lot of mess, you know what I'm saying? As far as his image and everything, everything that happened. So, you know, I get that. So I just looked at it like, um, you know, it was just on his part that it was best for him to just Go on, go on his path, and for me to go on, you know, go on my way. You know, just decide to look well, at is, it. it. I mean, isn't this just sort of ironic, though, from a certain level when you look at it? When you say, okay, he can't really be associated with a convicted drug dealer. He has to clean up his image. But to this day, when you even hear like his newest songs, it's all about selling cocaine. It's all about selling drugs. It, the, you know, the the content has never really changed or evolved. He's rapping in 2020 about the same thing he was rapping in like 2001. Yeah, it's been almost it's been almost two decades now, and it's really the exact same subject matter. You know, Jay Z was rapping about cocaine in 2001 and 2020, not so much. But Pusha T has stuck to his lane. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah. But uh, I mean, what, that's, what, that's what that's what he, you know, like how can I say? That's what he knows. You know, that's the lane that you know he got. A, he got a fan core base. That's that that what they want to hear. So you know, he's content with just stand, stand right there at the level that he got. You know, and and just feeding that that core fan base that wants to hear it. You know, he's content with that. Well, Pusher T gets married, and you don't get invited to the wedding. Hurt. Uh, did that hurt? Hurt. 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 And, you know, it's funny because um, I called him before when I found out he got married. And this was before the argument. I called him, and I say, you know, we just talking, da 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 So I'm, I'm actually waiting for the chance to say, hey, um, you invite me to the, you, you invite me to, to, to the wedding? So when I said something about the wedding, he says, um, uh, I ain't handling that part of it. You know what I mean? So right then and there, I'm like, oh, okay. I go tell my wife. I said, yo, he said he ain't handling that part of it. I, and she said, well, I don't think you're being invited. I was like, dang, that's, 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 and like, that's crazy. You know what I'm saying? And, um, <laughs> you know, so I mean, I mean, I don't know. I understand it. I still don't, I mean, I still don't understand it, but you know, for a long, you know, for, for a period of time, I was hurt. But right now, how I feel right now is like, it is what it is. I'm a grown man, so you know what I mean? <laughs> ain't, ain't tripping now. I'm not, but I was hurt. What about your relationship with Mouse? Uh, you know, when I was in prison and I was first telling Mouse because I knew he had a book out and you know he mentioned my name in the book, and um, he had the Netflix thing out. He mentioned my name in the Netflix thing. So I'm like, all right, cool. You know, and he was sending me like um, like prayer quotes and all that, you know, when he in there, you know. So, so I'm, so I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm getting all this. So I'm like, all right, cool. So I'm talking to him. So I tell him, yo, I want to I want to put me a book out, you know. So he's like, yo, I'm going to help you. We're going to put it out. I'm talking to this person for it, da, da, da. Um, I end up getting, um, I end up getting out. He still said he gonna help me, um, but then I think when he found out that that um, that Pusha didn't want the book to come out, that's when he like backed off of it. But you know we we're still talking, but then um, I felt I felt some kind of way, you know honestly I felt some kind of way and I said, you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna back up from that situation. I don't even want to talk to him no more, because you know he got to go for what his brother. <laughs> um, um, doing, you know, he just have to. So I said, um, I'm gonna back away from that situation. So I haven't talked to him either. 
Do you expect at some point that you'll reconcile with the clips? Or do you think at this point your lives have moved in such different directions? I mean, you know, Pusher T is now, you know, an even bigger rapper. Malice is now fully Christian. Uh, you've left the drug game alone and you're running legitimate businesses. You know, you guys have had some great memories together, but you may just not have a lot of stuff in common anymore. If it do, it do. Um, I'm not going to force that. Um, and the honest truth, I'm not even thinking about that. Like, you know, you know, just like you're saying, like, I think everybody's going in different directions. And, you know, like if I saw him, it wouldn't be no, you know, da 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 da. It is just, you know, I speak and I keep it moving. I mean, you know, that's just how I look at it. I'm 44 years old, man. Like, you know, it is what it is. I'm I'm appreciative though of everything that both of them done for me. When I say that, because from 01, from taking me off the streets of Bay and putting me in that position, you know, I would have still probably been in the drug game forever. And, and then, you know, anything could have happened. So from 01, from the time that I got picked up, I appreciate them for them moments right there. But the one thing about it, you definitely can't erase nothing that I actually did when it comes to, you know, when we first started. In retrospect, if you look at when they're working on their second album and things got slow and you decided to jump back in the drug game, if you could rewind time and say, you know, if I had just waited a while longer and just not even jump back in, Eventually, the second album came out. Pusher T's career eventually started to blossom again. Uh, I could still, you could could have potentially still been in the mix and had a good career without ever touching the drug game and never done those eight eight and a half years and not involved your family and you know and all the the bullshit that went along with it. Do you ever think about that? I wouldn't have did nothing differently. I wouldn't have did nothing different. I don't got no regrets on anything I did. But you got to also understand this, because one thing that you can't do, well, you can do, but you can't do that I never do, is the what ifs. Because you got to look at it. We don't know what, like, did they probably would have still been the clips and he he wouldn't have signed, he wouldn't have signed the um, <laughs> Kanye. There's a chance that he wouldn't have. Now, he's a great enough artist, you know, because, you know, to me, actually, he's he's still one of the, the 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 best rappers, you know, far as rapping, you know, um, lyrically. But is there still no telling on what could have, what heights he could have reached, you know? Because they probably would have put out an album and it just went whatever it did, and they could have been just doing the same thing. But with but with my demise, that's when everything trickled, and you know, he, you know, I gave it substance. You know, from from what happened to me, you know, um, so so you know, the cars felt how they felt, you know. But we can't go on to what ifs. Well, Pusher T eventually starts beefing with Drake, <laughs> and Drake ends up sort of mentioning Pusher T's alleged drug dealing or lack of. Uh, I believe, I believe that. Drake got a lot of that from my interview with No Malice. Like, if you watch my interview with No Malice, how he sort of breaks down how he first, you know, how No Ma you know Malice started first dealing, and then he went out, went off to the military, and then that's when Pusher T, you know, got involved, and he mentioned the cousins. Like, if you listen to to the the Duppy freestyle, it basically came from our interview. And you know, depending on who who you who you talk to, some people say that. Pusher T won that battle. Other people say Drake won that battle. When, when you saw all that coming together and you weren't involved in it, but, you know, you were part of that whole crew, how did you take that? Well, I mean, well, actually, you know, I'm going to say both of them won. <laughs> I'm going to say both of them won, and I'm going to explain that, but... Going back, because I remember Drake, you know, was saying something about the cousins or whatever. The honest truth, I, I don't like I said, I know, I know the cousins, but the cousins never been wasn't no big time drug dealers. 
they wasn't they wasn't who what Drake is saying, oh, it was the cousins. You know, um, I don't know what cousins they are who, you know, who supposed to have been them cousins. But um I will say the reason why I say that both of them won because Pusha killed them far as everything he said and I mean it was a good play. Like I said, he's like one of the best. He's very smart, very intelligent, you know. Um so he won with that. But with Drake not coming back saying nothing, it didn't work for what Pusha wanted it to work for. Because you gotta understand this. Drake is 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 a way huge artist. So so w- without him coming and 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 making a big thing about it, you know, I, I you know, I look at it like the white Caucasian woman don't know who Pusha is. She know who Drake is. So <laughs> Drake did good by not saying anything and saying, oh, all right, I don't want my core fan base to even know who you is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, you know, so I look at it like, like Pusha won the battle, but Drake, it, it, I mean, he don't stop. I mean, he's he's still Drake. Well, yeah, and in an interview that Drake did, uh, with Rap Radar not too long ago, he basically said that him and Pusher T will never be cool. And when he was first listening to Pusher T, he thought he was the biggest drug dealer in the world. And how when he found out all that wasn't real, it was like kind of a big disappointment and, and, and so forth. And, you know, the, the whole drug thing associated with Pusher T is always going to be a very interesting topic because... It seemed like Pusher T did dabble in that, but he was never what he was saying he was in his lyrics, really ever. But, but and that's he, okay. But did he actually say in his lyrics that he was a that he was a big like? Did he actually say that? Mm. I, I see what you're saying. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, I guess you really gotta have to go through and really break yeah, down. Yeah, like the I mean, I don't think I don't think he actually said he was a a a, a, a drug lord. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not gonna sit here and say what he done because you know I ain't say that then and I ain't gonna say that now. But you know what I mean. But you know, I mean, I look at it like most rappers. That's what you know. That's what they do. They rap. Well, you have a new book coming out called yeah. "384 Months: The Sacrificial Lamb." Yeah. Why that name? Um, 384 months is what the feds, you know, they actually give out months. They don't give out years, you know. So, so that's what I was sentenced to, 384 months. And um, a whole bunch of reasons why I was a sacrificial lamb. Because if you look it up, it's, it's, it's like an uh, animal, a person who um, gets sacrificed for the greater good. And um, I look at it like, you know, not only for my family to be able to not be behind bars, um, you know, for friends and stuff who who I'm still cool with to this day, who didn't go to prison, who love me to death. Um, for uh, malice, for him to uh, find God, um, for, for Pusher to be in a position that he actually in now. You know, I feel I was sacrificed. You know, and it's crazy because with all that being said, it's still like I'm the one who who being pointed at as the bad guy. You know, so I look at it like, you know, I sacrifice for everybody else, you know, for um, for the good. Well, there is a silver lining uh, to the story. You're no longer a drug dealer. Oh, no. Scared to death. Scared to death. And you actually have a trucking company. Yeah. We were actually transporting legal goods this time around. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I haul vehicles. I haul vehicles. Um, yep. So, you know, but like I said, I'm 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 seatbelt, scared, scared to be around anything that's that's like <laughs> ain't going through that again. I got kids to raise. I'm 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 done. I'm done. Yeah, because I, I know that you just hear the story over and over again in some of the interviews that I've even done. You know, like I interviewed Boston George, uh, you know, who the movie Blow was based off of. And 
he was out of the game and he was living free and he just wanted to do one more deal. Just let me just do this one more deal and I could retire. And then that's the deal that sent him to prison. Or Freeway Ricky. He was he was going to be the, the king of hip hop in L.A. He was buying like this huge uh, concert hall and he was going to he had, you know, motels and his plug kept calling him over and over again to do one more deal. And he finally decided to do that one more deal. And that got him life in prison, which he ended up beating. But he ended up doing like 20 years in the process, but. He got to walk out, but it's always that one more deal. Like, okay, I'm doing okay now, but if I do one more deal, I could retire comfortably. And it's usually that last deal that ends up putting you away forever. Yeah. Do you think about that? No. <laughs> no. No. You know, actually, I don't... You know, it took me a minute to even want to come out with this book because, you know, I, I knew he was, a, you know, he was against it. So I said, all right, I, um, I'm not gonna put it out. But then the circumstances of of him going his way, I'm going my way. You know, I, I sit and I talk to a couple of the people, which I got a good, I got a good surrounding team who say, man, listen, you need to do what you got to do. So you know, because everybody is only thinking about them and their careers, and or, or so be it. So I got to think about me. Um, so far as just the book. You know, that's the only time that I'm that I'm even thinking about prison or any of that stuff. Otherwise, that I don't think about any of that at all. You know, but um, but I will say though, I take my head off to the guy who is sitting in prison doing thirty, forty years or never getting out, and they got certain family members, as far as like women, mother. Uh, wife or whatever is in another cell on the yard and he's sitting back like I'm a real guy because he didn't do what he had to do to free his family members. I take my head off to that guy because when being a drug dealer, you got to be cold hearted. You have to be cold hearted and like you said in the beginning, there's no ain't no fair game in any anything. So you got to be really cold and I won't built for that. I wasn't built for that, you know. So, 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 you know. Like I said, I take my head off to that guy. Well, that's real. I mean, you got to be honest with yourself. And not everyone's built built for this game. Uh, you know, I've I've told the story a few times. Uh, my stupid ass decided to go buy a kilo with a guy I know. Uh, you know, back in the late '90s, and I got ripped off. <laughs> you know, for $17,000 off the rip. <laughs> and uh, I remember I was mad. I was mad for a long time until, until I remember I mentioned this in my interview with Freeway Ricky. And he said, well, if he didn't rip you off for that kilo, you would probably would have ended up in prison. True. And, and it just hit, it hit me like a, like a ton of bricks. And I'm like, damn, you're, you're right. If, it cost you seventeen thousand dollars. Yeah, that seventeen thousand dollars, you know, with a kilo of cocaine, which is a full blown felony. Yeah. <laughs> and I can say this because it's way past the statute of limitations, and I never said his name or anything. Uh, it's like, had we successfully flipped that kilo and bought two more kilos or whatever, I could have ended up with thirty years, and my life has been great since then. Seventeen thousand dollars ain't shit to me these days. That's a nice vacation. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that for a week of my life, much less 30 years. So right. it all, it all kind of has to, you know, you really have to put everything in perspective yeah. and you have to realize, you know, at that point, I 100% realized I'm not built for the drug game. I'm not built for the illegal game. Let me just go back to doing regular legal work. And that's where I'm going to make my name. And, and it worked out great since then. It took a long time. But not everyone's built for this drug game. Most people are not. It's not designed for you to win. It's designed for you to lose. It's designed for the feds to win. You know, the feds are going to win. And they're going to bring down everyone with them. And uh, listen, I'm glad that you're out. I'm glad that you're healthy. I'm glad with your, with your wife and your daughters. You have a legitimate business. You could grow it slowly but surely. You don't, you don't have to worry about 
looking over your shoulder. You don't have to worry about getting killed. You don't have to worry about your family getting kidnapped. Uh, you did your time and you walked out of it. And, you know, with your upcoming book, 384 Months of Sacrificial Lamb, you should be allowed to tell your story just like you're telling your story now. I wish nothing but the best for you. Yeah. Like I said, I want to thank you for the platform. Absolutely, no. man. Absolutely. But keep keep doing your thing. I'm looking forward to actually reading the book. And, you know, possibly in the future, you know, you and uh, Pusher T and No Malice might might reconcile whatever you have uh, differently. They're absolutely going to watch every every second of this interview. Of course. <laughs> of course. I've interviewed both of them before. They're, they're very familiar with the platform, you know, as well as the whole re-up gang. And I'm sure Pharrell is going to watch it and, and everyone else like that. So... Uh, I think it's going to make an impact and whatever message that you're looking to send will absolutely reach the people you're trying to send it to. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, Tony Gonzalez, man, appreciate you coming in. All right. No doubt, man. Peace. All right. Thanks, Vlad.